Hi, I'm Addison Gelpie and welcome to Antiques Masterclass. Uh, we're going to do part two with John Brandler of What is a Print? The first part was fascinating and we've got to continue on straight away while we're still here. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy. Thanks, John. Let's, um, uh, let's continue. That was fascinating. You taught me so much so, so far. Let's, let's see what else we, we, we're going to learn. This is um, the front of a book. And, of course, books are printed. And you can pay many millions for some books. This is a, an artist called Billy Childish, who is dyslexic. So I'm never quite sure how much of the misspelling is deliberate and how much is genuine. Um, but I like his work. He f helped form a group called the Stuckists, who were against Tracy M. and Damien Hurst, people like that. The, the, um, the art installation of a pile of sand and three neon tubes. And, oh, isn't it wonderful? It's called Sunday Morning in New York. It's rubbish, you know. Anyway, so he, he did, um, he, was, he helped found a group who was, who was against the Turner Prize, basically. Okay. And, uh, but, but books are printed. So within books, you very often get good illustrations. And the Victorians, be, before the Victorians, it was always woodblock, which means they literally take the end of a piece of wood so you've got the grain. Yeah. They cut into the grain and they print. They can print in fairly large numbers um, doing that. It's always black and white. Uh, sometimes hand-coloured, but it's always black and white. But it'll tell you at the front of the book what it is. Uh, you get some beautiful, beautiful works like that. Then the Victorians discovered how to electroplate a copper sheet. And they put steel onto the, the copper plate and they realized they could print thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in some cases from these images. The first, so, I mean, we take it for granted that books will be illustrated throughout them, but the first books were done in the 1770s. Before that, you had a frontispiece. This happens to be the front cover of the book, but it could easily be within the cover. Mm -hmm. Before that, you had a frontispiece which may or may not reflect the story inside. So Hogarth did a lot of them, for instance. Um, in the 1770s, the, the most famous book and the most popular book, the Harry Potter, if you like, of the day, was a book called Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern, which if you ever want to go to sleep, start reading this book. <laughs> but anyway, and uh, an artist called John Nixon created a set of 12 illustrations for the beginning of each chapter. And this was the first known example of a book having illustrations throughout. Now, of course, we take it for granted. If you've got small children, every book you pick up will be three quarters illustration and a few lines of text. Mm -hmm. It's gone exactly the other way now. But that was the beginning of it. So these were created by... Um, Artists, they had to have read the book, and then that drawing, or that in this case the, the watercolour, was done to give you the, the whole story of that, chapter. of that chapter. So it was an amazing uh, mind jump. In those days, obviously, the, the, the printing wasn't so sophisticated, so the, the print runs were fairly small. So those books... It helped to encourage reading as well. You know it I mean? helped to encourage reading. Well, not in the 1770s, because by then, either you were wealthy and educated or you were poor and you weren't. So the, it, but, but by Victorian times then, when the, the, suddenly we got a middle class, then they wanted the books. Then they wanted the nicely illustrated books for their libraries. I mean, library only means 20 books. Mm. The word library only means 20 books. So... You've got these incredible artworks within, bound within a book, sitting on somebody's shelf. Um, this is fun. This is by Peter Blake. Everybody knows Peter Blake because he did the Sgt. Pepper's album. And um, they're great. Again, it was done for EMI. They were the leaders in using artists for record covers. Um, I didn't mention it before, but one, the, the very first record cover that Banksy did, if you can find one today, it's £10,000. Uh, if you can find a Sgt. Pepper's album from the original print run that Peter Blake signed when it was first done, as opposed to now, again, you're talking 10, 15, 20 thousand pounds. And once he signed more recently, obviously worth less. But you can tell that because of the, the, the published the details on the back of it. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. But this he did, he did two versions of this. The first one he did in, seven, I think it was 77, 
for Bieber, the shop. Are these lithographs? This is a lithograph on tin. Okay. Uh, which again is a very technical process because the slightest blemish shows up like a mirror, crack of glass. It, it's, and because these are tin, and it, in fact you don't see it on this, but they, they've, they've all got four holes in the corner because these were sold for 19 and sixpence, the babe rainbow mm -hmm. was sold for 19 and sixpence. And you just put it on your wall in your student digs, and that was it. And the edition was 10,000. So then fairly recently, um, about four or five years ago, with he did it for a charity, um, Pallant what House, down in Chichester. What would 19 and sixpence be in today's money? 19 and sixpence is 97 and a half P. Okay, so a pound, that's quite a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, he did this four or five years ago for Pallant House down in Chichester, fundraising for them. This was printed on tin. Again, it's an exact um, homage, if you like, to his earlier one, which is nice because he's doing it. Yeah. Uh, these, I think, were originally something like two or three hundred pounds. They're now about five, six hundred pounds. Okay. Um, but because they were on tin, most of them get damaged, usually where they've been dropped on the corner. Yeah. And I was looking on eBay last week, and there was one there, and it's absolutely perfect condition. Only two corners are bent. That's not perfect condition. <laughs> anyway. um, this is Black Lorat. Black is the one that started the whole street art yeah. thing, which we talked about last time. He did this print. This was his, his neighbour's dog, in fact. Um, and uh, he, did it in, he did the print in four different colours, and it sold out in just days. It was, it's a lovely, lovely print. Everybody likes it. People like, like street art like it. People like, like dogs like it. It's just one of those things. Everybody likes it. Uh, but this, again, this was a, this was a silk screen. So he could make the, the first one in black, and then the surround is different colours in the different editions. Um, this, is a, this is a photographic print, again, Black Lorette. He's known as the man who walks through walls, so he'll pick up his suitcase and just materialise somewhere and disappear. So he's walking through the wall. His autobiography is The Man Who Walks Through Walls. And, uh, but he did, he did the, the central part of that as a silkscreen. And so many people wanted it, he then did this for an exhibition in Paris. And he did it as a photograph of one of these stencils that he'd put on a wall. How much are these now? These are about 450, 500 pounds now. So they're, they're, they're affordable. They're oh, affordable. they're affordable. And I mean, it, with, with prints, the, the classic is that about a year or so ago, maybe 18 months ago, there was a print of Munch's Picture the Screen, which isn't his real title, but that's what everybody knows it as. Mm. Anyway, one of about eight or ten that are known to exist. And one of the big auction houses in London, I think it was in London, had it. And the estimate was something like two to three hundred thousand pounds. Footprint, you know, big money, when you think it's a multiple. It fetched 1.2 million. So people look at things and think, oh, it's a print. Throw it. Yeah. Well, 1.2 million you wouldn't normally throw out. Um, Everybody knows about Monk now. Everybody knows about Van Gogh prints. I mean, you know, when you think Van Gogh never sold a painting in his life. The only painting that's recorded as having been sold was actually his brother getting a friend to buy it for him, just so he could say, I've sold a painting. Yeah. Um, it's very easy after the event to say, oh, yes, I wish I'd bought a Picasso in Paris in the 1950s. I wish I'd bought a Monk in the, in the 1930s. I wish I'd bought a Rembrandt in 17... I wasn't around in 1650 to buy a Rembrandt print for a shilling. So the important thing is to buy, if you're going to buy prints, buy ones where you know where they're coming from. Make sure they're genuine, because with modern reproduction techniques, photocopiers, it's very easy. I've been caught a couple of times on internet auction sites, to be polite. Um, somebody's photographed it in a frame, behind glass. It looks genuine. The description says this is a print. It is a print, but it's a photocopied print. Mm -hmm. And it has no value. It is signed, but it's a photocopy it's signed. One of the pictures on here is by David Hockney, but he signed the printing plate. So every time the, the printing plate was printed, it bears a signature. Mm. The picture doesn't exist in any other form whatsoever. And he made it as a pure print. My view is, does it exist in any other form? So this picture, the middle part exists in another form. It, it's five feet high and it's stuck on a wall in Paris. Actually, it was painted on a wall in Paris. But that image, the whole thing, with the wall and the other graffiti, exists in no other form. Okay. 
Um, this is quite fun. This is by a man called Bruce McLean. And what he's done is he's printed the background, silk screened the background, and the character on the left hand side, he's, he's, he's put a dollop of white paint or ink onto the paper and then with a scraper made it into the shape of a person. So although he did a hundred of them, every one is very different. Okay. This is a print of, by one of my favourite artists, a man called Carol Waite. He was a friend of Larry. He got Larry into the Royal Academy. He taught Hockney, he taught Kitta, he taught Peter Blake, he taught everybody of note. And I just love it. it it's, um, it was an incident that happened while he was a child. There was a timber yard behind his house and it looked like the whole street was going to burn down, but the wind changed and it, it's got, you've got the movement. You, I mean, the things like the reflection of the woman in the window or the woman on the bike behind you. But this is a reproduction. This is offset life though. So he did a painting. The painting is about five or six feet square, five or six feet square. He did the painting, it was then photographed in the 1970s and a print was made from it. This is a reproduction. It's limited edition and Carol signed it and Carol oversaw the, the production, but it's still a reproduction. Mm -hmm. This is another one of his. This is Hoburn Circus, 1947. This print is, is just under a thousand pounds now. It was an edition of 250. You can see how Larry was influenced by him, can't you? Oh yeah. Um, this of course, this was building was bombed. Uh, Gamages on the left hand side, Some, if anybody's old enough to remember Gamages, um, Hatton Garden behind to the left, um, Fetter Lane is still there, these buildings, some of those buildings are still there. The Smithfield Market, they, they're talking about pulling down now. Um, this was, you can see at an angle, Daily Mirror building coming, okay. and of course now it's Sainsbury's. Uh, and this picture was lent to the, Imper the original was lent to the Imperial War Museum. Um, for a big retrospective of Carol some years ago. This is one of these book illustrations. Chagall did it as a book illustration. So you can have a Chagall, real print, a few hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. It's not pencil signed by him, but it's signed by him in the plate. Yeah, in the plate. So one of the things to look at when you're reading a description is, is it plate signed? Is it pencil or ink signed? Ink signs, you've got to be careful that it hasn't faded. The best signing you want is pencil signed because it won't fade. Graphic, graphite doesn't fade. That's a good tip for the viewers, actually. This is Worth a, more if it's pencil signed, generally? Well, if you, you'll get an edition, it'll only be signed in one way. Okay. So you won't get an edition signed in some in ink and some in pencil. That'll be weird. Yeah, if, if you've got that, just leave them alone, because it means there's a problem somewhere. Okay. Um, this is a bad photograph by me. It should be white around the outside, not pink. Okay. Um, but the touch is life. Uh, it was probably, I probably photographed it under a neon light. Um, this is by an artist called Deface. This is his tag sign down here. Yeah. Um, he was doing an anti-American one at the time. Um, this is the Statue of Liberty, obviously the Statue of Liberty. Um, but this exists in no other form. So this is a real print, silk screen. He did it. He supervised it. Anything he didn't physically do, he was supervising. And I think he actually does a lot of it himself. Um, but I like the humour, the, the street artists. I like the humour. There you go. Is it right? Is it wrong? Is it good? Is it bad? Do you like the colours? That's it. Master Hurst. Mr Hurst. Um, he did an edition of 125, but everyone is unique. Everyone, the colours are in different places. Okay. So, so it's a multiple, yeah. but it's a unique print. But how can it be a, a multiple and a print and unique? So he's, he's stretching he's played, about, he's, he's playing, playing with, with the, the yeah. concepts, he's playing with the ideas. Um, Keeps the value. I mean, what would that be worth? This is worth £20,000 because you've got a unique Damien Hurst. You will never see that again. The nice thing about anything that's unique, and this can go down to the image or just the, the numbering, is it can never be stolen effectively because if they steal it, they can't sell it. Mm -hmm. We had a lady in America, bought a print, used PayPal to get her money back, even because she said she hadn't got it. So we said, OK, you haven't got it. Um, she was very aggressive and rude, so I won't repeat it all. And um, Thank you. her point was, I'm 5,000 miles away, what was I going to do about it? And the way she did it made me very suspicious. So I said, right, well, what I'll do is I'll notify the FBI and Scotland Yard, because I thought she'd have heard of Scotland Yard. She was in San Francisco, um, that this has been stolen. Obviously, it's signed, it's numbered, so that makes it unique. So when your postman 
goes to sell it in 5, 10 or 20 years time, as it's been recorded as stolen, they will be prosecuted. Strangely enough, it turned up on her doorstep the following morning uh, and she sent me the money back. Uh, because it's unique. Yeah. So you can track it. So it's, it's, it's as val from that point of view, it's as valuable as the painting. It's the reproductions, the 5,000 from the Tate Gallery, uh, that, is, yeah. that are not reproduced. This isn't signed in pencil, but this is by Damien Hurst, and I showed this, I brought this, showed you, brought this with me, because this is a brilliant piece of graphics. He made it as a print. It's the size of a poster, like a film poster, but he printed it on reverse, in reverse. So the lettering, where it, so when you turn the sheet of paper over, it looks as if you're looking through the paper. Oh, okay, very clever. Very, very clever thinking. It, it, it is, they've, they've, it's almost as if they've got solid lettering and put paper around it. it. I don't know how they worked it out, but it's a very, very witty yep. thing to do. Um, I thought it was just so clever. There's a lot about Damien Hurst I don't like, but when he gets it right, it's brilliant. Mm. Um, again, another Damien Hurst record cover, um, Kate Moss. The, the records, because it was a small edition of only 666, being Damien Hurst, um, <coughs> on the other side of the record, it's, it looks very much the same, but round the black line, it's signed okay. and dated. This is a scratched signature. Um, this is Kate Moss. The, I mean, I think this is just fun. You, nobody bothers listening to the record. Yeah. Don't forget about that. But because it was a small edition, and when they do a small, what I would call a print run, but it's obviously a technical manufacturing term for it, whatever they do, they're made by hand. And e instead of being plain white, each record has got a few coloured granules put in when it's being made. So you get a, you can't see it on here, but you get a um, a rivering okay. of colour. So a shimmer, a of shimmer of colour yeah. in the record. So each one is unique. But again, I sell this as an edition of six hundred and sixty-six. The, the the record sleeve is numbered. It's it's not pencil signed. It's just a sticker numbered, so it can be traced. But the to me, it's an edition of six hundred and sixty-six, and each record is unique, rather than a unique record. 600 plus mm. times. Mm. It, it's how you phrase it. This is a CD he did of one of his spin, one of his spin paintings. Spin paintings. Um, the originally 10,000 made, so if you want to be pedantic, a limited edition. There were 10,000 made. 10,000 CDs made. 10,000 CDs, but most of them got crushed because there was a problem with one of the, one of the companies involved in the process went into liquidation, I'm told. Um, and so most of them were crashed. It was only the ones that had already been sold that got out onto the market. Okay. So these sell for £75. Because it's a limited edition, Damien Hurst. Um, this is the David Hockney I was talking about. I don't know if you can see it, but down here on the screen it looks like a blur, but that, that's the signature. Okay, printed in. And this was done... <clears throat> Carol Waite, I mentioned before, uh, invited Hockney to put three pictures into the Royal Academy before he was an academician. And he put three very large prints in. Now we're talking 1987, and they were between 10 and 12 and a half thousand pounds. They were the size of two of these panels. Okay. Yeah. Big, big, big. Big prints. Anyway, the Royal Academy sold one copy of one of the prints. And the president of the Royal Academy was Sir Roger de Grey. And um, we didn't see eye to eye, but anyway. Um, he made sure you knew his name was Sir Roger de Grey. <laughs> and. Um, he used to, and in case you didn't get the idea, he used to walk around with a medallion, six inches wide, saying, President, Royal Academy. Right. So, um, Roger, so Roger gave Hockney a lecture on how to be a successful artist. Now, at the time, a Roger de Grey painting was 5,000 plus, which was big money in yeah. 1987. So that happened in 1986. So in 1987, Hockney put 10,000 of these in at 18p. And sold out within within minutes. They'd all gone. Most people folded them and put them in their back pocket. I was very lucky. I managed to get some, and I've kept them. They've all got the centre fold down the middle. Okay. And uh, I've got some, and I've kept them flat. And the eighteen p is now worth um, best part of two hundred pounds. Okay. Oh, and the would you degrade five hundred five thousand pounds? That's also worth about two hundred pounds. Okay. 
So don't buy by name, buy what you like. And in percentage terms, these are probably outperformed most of the other things you're going to see. This is a common theme through all the experts that we have coming in here. Everybody says, and, and, and I'm sure you've hopefully got the point now, that if you want to buy something, if you like it, then buy it. If you love it, then buy it. If it yes, means something to you and what, your heart. It, what I would say is not, don't just buy it if you like it. Buy it if you like it, and there are two routes to go. One, you trust the person that's selling it to you, mm -hmm. or two, go away and do your homework. Find out why you're paying X amount of, oh, of money course, for Of course, always it. do your homework, but if you love it, then that's the starting that's point. That's the starting point. That's the starting point. Say to the dealer, that, or, or whether it's a, if it's on eBay, contact the seller and say, why is it this price? And if they're a genuine seller, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. If it's a dealer, they'll love to tell you, because it's their passion. It's what we do, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and if you're doing your research and something seems to be too good to be true, then do a bit well, more research because... Well, we had a conversation with the FBI about this lady in America. And they told me at the time, they set up a website. And the website is if it's too good to be true .com. Oh, really? You know, <laughs> if it's a scam, if it's too good to be true, it's a scam. Yeah. If I said to somebody, you've got to buy this today, it's £200 because in five years' time, it's going to be 20000 I'm either a liar or a fool. Yeah. If I say to you, if you like it, buy it. That's the right money for it today, but where it will be in five years' time or ten years' time, nobody will know. Who knows? That's and you've got to. That's why you've got to. That's why I said one is do you trust the dealer, or two do your research or do both. Mm -hmm. Dealers get caught sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so it, it's having nice things. It doesn't matter that it's a print that exists in no other form. It was only done as a print. It's reproduced in his book, Hockney on Art, over a double-page spread, so he's obviously pleased with it. He's proud of it. Um, it raised money for the Royal Academy. It raised money for Bradford. This is another one he did in the newspaper, um, and it's just called Lemon and Fruit, and Tree or something. Um, but why not use a newspaper? Why not use every medium that's available to an artist? It doesn't have to be... Like Peter Blake, it doesn't have to be... Uh, a great deal of money to buy good art. History tells you what it, what, if it's going to be a lot of money or mm -hmm. not. Um, this is Deface again, Superman. I just think it's a great spin on the idea. Um, this is a print. Can you go back? Can you just go back to that again? Of course. So we show it to the viewer full screen, actually. Okay. But it, it, it's, um, it's quite it, fun. It, it's, it, it's a bit of fun. But it, it, again, it's this artist, Deface. He's famous for this particular variations on this particular theme of Superman, um, not quite so super. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a print from original artwork. This is the part of Doctor Who. This is, hence the TARDIS in the yeah. bottom, right? And this was one of the stories from a, a group of four stories called Voyager. They put the four stories together and published a book. But it starts off as artwork, then it's photographed. Then uh, it, it was first drawn in black and white. Then they decided they wanted to make it into a book. So they got another artist, actually, to colour it. Then they photographed it again okay. and made the coloured book. So there were different stages, sometimes, in getting the, the finished article. So you could find a print of this in black and white. You could find a print of this in colour. You could find it in a book. Or you could find the original artwork, okay. painting. This is another of my bad photographs. This is a very, very small picture. This is, for bio, this is a, an original lithograph, like I discussed before, mm -hmm. of, by a man called Edward Borden, who was the master of lithography. This is from the 1930s. Um, materials were scarce, but he could, he could make the smallest amount of materials, the most beautiful artwork. He did a series. This is from a, um, a series of 16 that he did of life in an English village. And what was amazing was that he had the foresight to record it at the time, and in the 1930s, anybody going to, to around the village would have seen all of those 16 illustrations. And now, of course, it's history. Yeah, yeah. So there's a baker's, there's a schoolroom, there's a inside of a church, there's um, the blacksmith, there's the mecha car mechanic, all sorts of things that you just never see today. This was done as a, for uh, an opening of uh, a gallery in London. Again, Time Out did the poster without all the wording as a charity fundraiser, and Gilbert and George, they are, they are amazing. This is what gave Banksy the idea to do his self-portrait yes, as well. Yes, so. yes. 
This um, was the first one that Time Out did yes. that with Gilbert and George. And um, they did a thousand of these. Five hundred of them were given out at the event. Five hundred of them were. Ended they up printed being sold. signatures, or they no, probably. These Gilbert and George are wonderful. They will. They sign. They either don't sign it at all, or, or, it, sign or it's or they sign it by hand. Um, this was done in a newspaper, hence the folds. And again, most of these things get destroyed. So the ones that survive in good condition, although they're printed, and although the, the original print run was quite large, the numbers that survive are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. They're quite rare. Um, this is one of two that um, Gilbert and George did for the Serpentine Gallery yep. in t um, 2002. And the Serpentine Gallery... I sold the whole collection quite recently, actually. They also yeah, they... sort of £400, £300, £500. Yeah. Sort of. um, but they're fun, they're bright, and they're collectible. Right, and this is the polite one. There is another pair to it, yeah. which I didn't bother bringing. But the, what was nice about these was the Serpentine Gallery, which, let's face it, is basically government-funded. The Serpentine Gallery said, they always say to their artists, to help fund the exhibition, we want to do a, an edition of prints. And Gilbert and George don't do them. So they say, so the Serpentine said, well, look, you know, if we do some posters, will you sign them? I said, yes. So they did 6,000 posters of each of the two images. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the show, um, they rang me up and they said, we've got a couple of thousand left. Do you want to buy them as a job lot? And I said, yes. OK. I had to pay up front, fair <laughs> enough. And then it was a case of, oh, no, you can't collect them now because we're doing something. Can't collect them now because we're taking an exhibition down. Can't collect them now because we're putting an exhibition up. But all this sort of thing. And after about six weeks, I said, look, it was, it was ended up with 4,000 posters because they found some wrong. But 4,000 posters. Um, I'll come up at 7 o'clock in the morning, be with you early one morning, 40 packs, 100 in a pack, put them in the back of the car, go. Oh, yes, you were dealing with Melissa. Yes. Melissa's left. So? Um, and when somebody says, didn't Melissa tell you, it's always going to be bad news. Gilbert and George, being perfectionists, had insisted that every print, poster, had gone in a separate cardboard tube before it left their studio. So I didn't buy 4,000 prints, I bought 4,000 cardboard tubes. Oh my goodness, you needed an Arctic lorry. Lorry to move them, yes. yes. And that's the bit that Melissa had forgotten to tell me. Um, but they had you spent... You've, have you sold most of them? Oh, we're selling them all the time. Um, they're about £35 each. Okay. Um, that's unframed. And uh, they're great things. And, but Gilbert and George spent a week signing them. Every single poster wow. was from the printers, a team of people in front of Gilbert, he handed it, somebody handed it to George, and then it was put in a tube. So every single one he signed. This one is both, both of them are in gold pen. Some of them are both in silver, and some of them have got one in gold and one in silver. Just when, whenever the pen ran out, they mm -hmm. just grabbed the next one. But they spent a week doing it. Now, the Serpentine knew what they were. The Serpentine, I personally think, were trying to get them to make an etching. And they said, no, we'll sign the posters. You put the posters in front of us, we'll sign them. They, they stuck to their word. Mm -hmm. I think the serpent. Personally, I think the serpent time were a bit naughty, but I'm not complaining because I've got the, I've got them, you know. Perfect. Uh, but they're fun, and they're nice. Okay. Um, this is another one. He did it. this. This was the ultimate. This was um, go online and download it from the newspaper. Yeah. And you downloaded it as nine separate pictures. Yeah. I, and then I, I sold, assembled it yourself. I, I sold one of those, actually. I sold one of those, uh, literally, with the collection that I had. And it was, he'd put it together and put it all in a big frame, made it quite big, actually. Yes. I think it made about four or five hundred pounds yeah. again. But this was downloaded off the internet. Yeah. Not unsigned, but it was a oh, limited yeah. edition. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. This, again, you know, people think if it's printed, it's got to be on paper. This is a print by, um, I'm the artist now. But anyway, he, there were four glasses done for Beck Spear. Oh, this is Roderick Buchanan, that's right. And this is a still from one of his videos. Um, but it's printed on glass, which is quite a technical thing yeah, to do. Yeah, definitely. So that, because this glass is curved, a Bexpeer, everybody knows that shape of a Bexpeer glass, mm -hmm. it's famous. Um, so this is, it's shaped that way, and of course it's curved round. So to print that on there, it, must, it was a very technical printing technique. Yeah. And they did this to celebrate, I, I I think it was 10 years of Beck sponsoring art exhibitions. Um, this is um, Kathleen Hale, uh, who's famous for Orlando the Marmalade Cat. Um, and what happened with that was that this, she was at a dinner party. 
literally just after the war and saying what she did and what she wanted to do and um, the editor of Country Life said these are wonderful but you know we can't print them it's too complicated and too costly so she said what I will do is I will do four drawings for each color for each pr picture but each drawing is the will will become the printing plate and they were working with a printer in Ipswich called Cowles, C-O-W-E-L-L. -L. And they invented, Cowles and Kathleen Howe between them, invented a thing called Plastic Cowl. It's a plastic sheet that she did four drawings on. And each drawing was a separate colour. And that's how you get the multicoloured. And that's how, they, and that's and that's how that was done. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly after that, they invented photolithography and okay. Plastic Cowl never took off. Okay. But this is in, this was his, this was important in the in the the history of printing, mm -hmm. uh, and this is one of the plastic owls. So you can see this is the black with the writing on it, and they they used blue to write on printing plates because it isn't picked up in the process. This I, I just had to include this, although it's my bad photograph again. It's not quite it's pink, but it's not quite as pink as that. This is the pier at Westminster. This is by a man called Leigh Kenyon. And um, Lay Kenyon, Lay Kenyon, K E N Y O N, and in fact he is being celebrated this week, which tells you when the, this is being recorded, because Lay was one of the four forgers that made the documents for the Great Escape. Oh wow! Okay. And I bought these prints, and then I started to do some research, and we actually gave a set of four to the Stalag Thirteen or whatever it is Museum in um, Germany. Well done. And there's an association of ex-prisoners. And they said, oh, could we buy one? And I said, which one do you want? And they said, well, whichever one's cheapest. And I said, well, it doesn't matter because I'll just give you the set. Um, they belong there. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, well the, done. the original book on the Great Escape has his illustrations in, pen and ink drawings, very often. Um, and he, he then went on to, art was always his passion, but he then went on to be a test pilot for helicopters to work out how low the helicopter could be without it crashing. If the engine stalled... That's a safe long-term job, isn't it? Well, he, died, he actually died at a good old age, but he was a test pilot for helicopters where you switch off the engine and you can, and you can restart it before you hit the ground. Yeah, no, I've heard, yeah, I've heard of that. But if you... He wasn't allowed to take part in the escape because the forging in, under those conditions damaged his eyesight too much. So he wasn't allowed to escape. That's what kept him alive. Because, of course, they shot... They shot 50 of them, didn't they? Well, no, they shot 47 out of 50. So, yeah. um, so that's what kept him alive. And he was a great... I think, personally, he was a great man, as well as a good artist. Um, so I had one. This is a piece of fun. This is a, a print okay. by um, a gentleman, and he was very famous in his own right. He was asked to design the lights at Blackpool one year. And being very flamboyant himself, um, he created six of these. And the, 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 the burlesque girl on the left, the, the light is 12 or 15 feet high. And then the, the flowers and strands go across to the middle of the road where there's another oh, wow. lamppost. And then it's reversed. So every place, there's four of them. Okay. Um, and these are by Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, who actually I consider to be a very, very good artist. But it, people don't see his artwork. They see the it's a flamboyant interior decorator. Yeah, but he actually is brilliant. And I, talk, uh, when I was talking to Which him. Which would make about, sense as well. Yeah, and I, you know, he understands the history of art. He understands the the creation of art. And that's very him. And that's very him. And um, that's a that's a, a thing he did for a charity down in Cornwall. Um, and because it was a charity and the village, it was to raise money for the village hall, the village hall is literally next to the sea, it's probably washed away now by now. So he made a, did a mermaid. Beautiful. Um, and he is very, his art that he does here, I think that's really it's sums, nice. sums it's, it's Lawrence very up nice. there. Really. It's very, very nice. Um, who's, who's that by? <laughs> this is quite famous. Uh, or it's, it's an art, this is the painting. Uh, you can see the sellotape marks from the justification. But this is by a lady called Marion Wilson. And she's got work in the okay, no, Victorian no. Albert Museum yeah. and things like that. But again, a lot of your viewers will know um, the four Clinton cards. There was another one. What was it called? I can't remember. I can't remember either. It's terrible. And she met this gentleman. It'll come to me on the train going home. 
that she, she met this gentleman at his dinner party, and she was only about four foot nothing. And um, oh, it was a double barrel name, wasn't it? Not Clinton. It was not Clinton. It was, uh, anyway, she met this guy at a dinner party in about 1950. And um, he said, I want to start a new company. I, you're an artist, great. Do one for me. That'll be your test piece. And I want to do a thing, greetings cards, like I've seen in America. And um, so she did one, which I've got. And um, his name like Gordon Russell, something like that. Um, he became a multi multi millionaire on the strength of these cards. They were everywhere. It was. But Marion Wilson cards, people actually went out and bought Marion Wilson cards and framed them up, a lot of them that sort of size. Fantastic. And we bought a collection from her. And we sold one. The guy came in, had, was having a look through the folio. And I'll buy it. He didn't even ask how much it was. I told him how much it was. He said, yep, I'll have it. And I'll have that one as a pair to it. I said, great. You've, you've seen her work before. Oh, yes. Um, it was the first card I bought my girlfriend. Oh, really? Uh, and we've been married for 45 years. And he bought this card. Gordon Fraser. Gordon Fraser. That was it. Gordon Fraser card. Before, before my phone. And um, he made the... the he f was the forerunner of card shops as we know them today. But he drove his Rolls Royce into a lamppost in France one day. And that was the end of him. And, that was the, and that's why Clinton Cards took them over. But they had the most amazing archive as well. Um, so that's... So again, you get a painting, you get a print from it. That's another one of hers. That's just almost a self Oh, that's fun. Look at this. Marianne Michael Jackson Marianne records. Wilson. She's still around, isn't she? Did she do some... Um... She did dressmaking as well. Who? Marion Wilson. Uh, she did fabric design. Fabric I don't design. know if she That's did right. dressmaking, but yeah. she did fabric design. Um, limited edition record, my, but printed. Yeah. And in fact, the way the record is made is virtually a printing process. Um, photographic print by an artist. This I love. This is, uh, a guy, again, street artist, Nick Walker. This is from a series called The Morning After, as in The Morning After, The Night Before. Um, and the gentleman on the left, usually in a bowler hat, um, has done the vandalism. And you can see, if you look closely, the where his hand is touching the lamppost, there's the red paint. So that's the red okay. paint where he's been painting, where uh -huh. the paint has dripped down the Empire okay. State Building. There's two versions of this. One is multicoloured, the much rarer one, just has red paint. Very clever. You've got to look at it a little bit before you realise what it is. You've got to look. You've got to use yeah, your yeah, brains. I like that. You know? I like that. Um, this is a Peter Blake that we mentioned early on. This is from a series of eight he did for Alice in Wonderland. He did it as a book illustration. He did it as a, as a, as a fine art print as Litho, well. Litho again? Again, offset lithograph. Um, you can work out who that is. That's a Picasso. Mm -hmm. This is a lino cut. So, um, again, it won't last forever. It will, you will make 100, 200, 300, something like that from the line of cut before the edges start to fray. But you can't go back and rub it out. Once you've cut into that lino, it's permanent. Yeah. It's like a hammer and chisel. So that's why I put that there. This is um, one of the very famous portraits Picasso did. Lovely, colourful. That's about three, four hundred, five hundred pounds in some forms. Signed, 50, 60,000. Um, so are you buying a signature or are you buying the image? Again, landscape by him. Look how simple that mm -hmm. is. But you can see every cut that he's made. Mm -hmm. This is um, an offset litho of a David Hockney. This was done initially as a print run of a thousand with overprinting for a gallery in the West End. And they kept some without the overprinting and this is one of them. But it's still an edition of a thousand. Even though 800 have been overprinted, 800, 900 have been overprinted. It's an addition of a thousand. Mm -hmm. Most of them ha then have addi additional work done on them. Um, posters. These are all printed. These these have no significant value. If I hear somebody's got a child, I just send them one. This is just sort of A4 size. Um, this I like. This was an Andy Warhol um, that um, was done with Diana, and then uh, it was used as an exhibition poster. So it was a limited edition exhibition poster from a very, very limited Andy Warhol. Okay. Um, Pure Evil, I've talked about him before. This is Ava Gardner, and uh, it's a silk screen. It's 
a limit, an addition of 100 or 150. How much would one of those be for period? That's 150 pounds. Okay. Yeah. So they're not a lot of money. They're, this is roughly 72 centimetres square. 72 by 73, that sort of thing. Um, they vary slightly in sizes. He did this in three different colourways. Um, he is selling via the Saatchi Gallery. can't get enough of his work. Mm -hmm. um, this I like because wow. it shows the... This is neon. It's called Neon Bunny, but it's actually on this, a green cellulose sheet. The black is printed. Um, so it's just a two colour. It's just, just a two colour. It's a one colour because the, the green is the, is the background colour. And I just think it's lovely. And, it, and yet it looks like you're looking into one of these infinity mirrors. But it is a print. Who's the artist again? That's pure evil again. Okay. So is that. That's Jackie Kennedy. That's a small one. And although he's done an addition of 50, you can see this is number one over 50. Mm -hmm. It's signed, it's numbered. But all 50, every one of those 50 is slightly different because it's done by hand. It's where he's put the ink in the top of the silk, the, the, the cage. Mm -hmm. squeezed it through and because he's not a machine the pressure is going to be different so everyone is, is slightly slight different, different yeah. so but what I like what I like about pure evil is that he's got integrity so he doesn't say I've done 50 prints he says I've done one print 50 times and there are differences yeah. that's another one Makes this this individual. is this is great because it's um, London Underground had an exhibition recently at their uh, with the Underground Museum and it was called Art on the Underground. And, they, and of course, street art is an underground movement because it's an illegal movement. It started off illegally painting, actually painting on trains. Mm -hmm. So he's taken a print and put a painting over it. So mixed media, painting, print, how do you want to title it? What do you call it? To me, it's a print with a painting over it. Um, this is um, what we used as a Christmas card. He did that as a painting. We then got it photographed and made into a high-quality Christmas card, but the edition was only 500. Okay. So, it's, so sometimes Christmas cards, if this almost harks back to Marion Wilson, where people collect a card. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you can see where the ink merged. He used two colors, and, but it's still a print. Again, 29 over 50, and every one is very different. So, but it is still a print. This is his most famous image. Uh, the Hackney Looter. Um, it's just great. It, he mm. brought it out at the time of that sporting event, which we're not allowed to name because otherwise they get upset. And um, really? so seriously, yeah, they get very upset if you use that particular word. Um, of course, this isn't that event because the five rings aren't connected and they did check it out. He put this onto two walls in London and it got 2.3 million hits in five days. Wow. The, this print was initially published at 150 pounds, and then now 1800, 1900 pounds. In a year. In well, how long is it since the Olympics? Two years, nearly. Yeah. Two years. Um, this is another Banksy. I love it because it's a it's a record cover again, but he did it in two different colourways. So the front is blue, or in my opinion, the front is blue because I like the blue one. Other people like the yellow. You could frame it either way. You've got two pictures for the price here. Again, it's a couple of hundred pounds. It's a limited edition. It's a Banksy. If you want to pay 10,000, you can get one with a signature on it. But so the only di the difference is you're paying 9,800 pounds for a signature. signature. Uh, this is another one he did. Um, the print of that by Banksy, which is quite big. Uh, it's probably best part of a meter square. Um, without the w writing on it, is anywhere between 35 and 45,000 pounds. So 200 pounds, or something 12 inches square in old money or enough to buy you a nice car again another one he did this in four different colorways and um, I just think they're great he's, he's, it shows the humor of the artist but it's an affordable print it's a mm -hmm. limited edition affordable print another one by him this is by an American artist called Tully Tuttle. and I don't see the skill in that I can see the marketing in it because he's relatively famous. And I think there's one of these in the Tate Gallery. But, you know, is this the right order, the wrong odd order? No. Basically, who cares? Mm. Um, there's a lot but of that's a thousand pounds. Yeah. And, and of course, taking it to the extreme, you then get something like this, which is an Andy Warhol poster. But because he signed it, it's worth money. 
almost like a Gilbert and George's, except that Andy That's Warhol didn't sign many of them. Yeah, so they're worth a lot more. So they're worth a lot more. But again, you know, to buy this as a painting or to buy this as the print as without the writing silk as a screen. silk yeah. screen, which he didn't do anyway. Yeah, yeah. You know, he had the factory. I mean, a series this was of honest. ten of these, aren't yes. they? Yes, yeah, a series of ten of these. Um, you can buy the, the, the reproductions made by a group called Sunday Bee Morning, which is a... So they, they look the same as the originals, they're just stamped differently on the back, between 500 and 1,000 pounds, depending as to how they're framed. Okay. But something like this, where he signed it, is relatively scarce, but it's still affordable. This is a couple of thousand. Okay. This is another one. This is in a series, Raining Queens. He did these as posters for a gallery in Denmark. And they came, bought the Borge Bergensen Gallery. And they were the publishers of the very famous print of Ingrid Bergman. They got Ingrid Bergman to Warhol. And then they had a long-term relationship with Warhol. So these were, this was signed specifically for this one gallery. There you go. So what's a print? Anything. <laughs> But they are all yeah. limited editions. There is no such thing as an unlimited edition. It can be open-ended. It means that the printers can go back to it again and print off another 50, 100. Depends if they're signed and numbered legally. But, I mean, one publisher got into a great deal of trouble and I think went bankrupt because they were doing editions by an artist, selling out and then changing the size of the print by a quarter of an inch and then doing the same image again. Oh, OK. Now, Legally, it's different, but people really aren't that stupid. So morally, it was wrong. And uh, I don't know how they described it. They, they did, somewhere in the small print, it said something. But you know. Well, well, you've given us you've given us some really good pointers, John, and uh, some fascinating images there with some great um, great insight into the different artists and what the different prints are. We're going to put a little link at the bottom there to give the grading of different of different prints, um, which we'll do, yeah. which we'll which we'll put on the which end. Which is definitely following up right it's, now. It's not it's not yeah. um, it's not finite, and there's all grades in in between each one. But it's a basic thing. Did the artist make it? Did they? Did the artist have it made under his supervision, or is it the Sunday Times? Mass but even the Sunday Times is switched off. John, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, imparting your, your fantastic information over to our viewers. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks' time with the next edition of Antiques Masterclass with another expert talking about uh, little tips and their experience. Thank you very much. I've been Addison Gelpie, and thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir.